Thank you very much, Thomas, um, for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you also to uh, Oscar and Bo uh, for inviting me. And thank you all for turning up. Um, what I am going to do is, um, it could be misunderstood if I'm not careful. Um, it could be misunderstood that I'm going to sort of pose to you simply these three different uh, approaches, uh, knowing exactly how they should be woven together and turned into a great big strong three-strand approach, uh, but waiting to find out if you know. Um, and basically, uh, I have to say, this is a much more dialogic occasion as I for see, as I see it. It's an occasion when um, the most important thing that will happen once I've started the ball rolling is the, the discussion uh, amongst us, uh, not necessarily simply a, a question-answer, though I'll, I'll certainly take questions if you have them, but what we say to each other sideways, horizontally, is uh, at least as important, if not more so, in my view, uh, than uh, what I have to say. Um, and that will make it a good occasion. So let me, having sort of set the scene a little for a moment, uh, indicate um, what I have to say about these three approaches. And um, I'm going to begin, actually, with the notion of media for development. Um, and this has a, a, a history. It has a history with people like Wilbur Schramm and Daniel Lerner in the United States in the 1950s, um, who really... Uh, were part of uh, a Cold War scenario uh, in which the prize was what was then called, or be began to be called, the Third World. Um, and the competitors were the United States and the West and the Soviet bloc and its, its allies. However, this is often said about these people, but I think what is sometimes missed is that I think it is fair to say that Wilmer Schramm, much as I might disagree with him on a number of points, Wilmer Schramm saw the uh, issue of global poverty as being something which was not simply something to be corrected so that the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc could not have a, any kind of uh, toehold, but it was something to be addressed in its own right. It was something which he actually deeply con cared about and something which he thought that American capitalism and Western capitalism was uniquely able to solve. So even though we might disagree with his strategies, I think to see him simply as an arch manipulator is to kind of reduce him to being a kind of a stick figure, not actually a, a complete human being. And the same for the even more impassioned uh, cold warrior Daniel Lerner. Um, out of their activities uh, developed a whole tradition now many decades long of uh, funded developments from USAID or its equivalents around the world in the Western countries, um, funded projects uh, which were of various kinds, uh, sometimes simply to develop uh, drinkable water, sometimes for literacy, sometimes for all medical purposes and so on, but funded specific projects and the role of communication researchers was to contribute their expertise to trying to make sure that these projects actually worked. Well, in a sense, so far so good, except that uh, very often uh, the pattern of these projects was of people from the United States or other Western countries parachuting into countries, um, setting up projects, setting up projects in terms that they thought were valid, rarely if ever consulting, let alone working with, the people and communities that they were working with, and simply saying, okay, we have the money, we have the goods, take it, learn, develop. And, of course, that's hopelessly flawed. And there's a whole literature out there which, which uh, illustrates in some detail uh, why it's flawed, or at least argues why it's flawed. 
Um, one of its chief exponents uh, did a kind of a mid-career correction, uh, Everett Rogers, who died uh, just two or three years ago now. And he did a mid-career correction in some ways based on an image of the Chinese Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. Uh, and it was very much an image of that wrenching social process in, in China. But what uh, Rogers tried to draw from that was the necessity of getting engaged with the communities and the localities where these development projects were taking place and to be less kind of one way, less vertical in, in its approach. And that has developed over time into a much more encouraging way of, of looking at uh, the, the, the role of media in this process, uh, which is very often now called, uh, goes under the heading of communication for social change. And Thomas here is uh, co-editor of a vast couple of volumes of, of uh, essays from around the world on that issue with Alfonso Gamusio Dagron, who I believe has been here to speak on an earlier occasion. Um, and that definitely, that, that whole approach is designed to be very different, much more horizontal in its, in its activity. And looking at the role of communication and media in the process of social change and the process of development in the global south in ways which necessarily engage the people who are involved. That, that, that it's no longer action upon people. It is action with and out of people's definition of their situation and their prioritization of their needs. Now, having said that, though, um, I think it's still true to say that over about 15 years ago, um, the word participation and participatory communication began to become a kind of a buzzword at very high levels, uh, even as high a level as the World Bank. And indeed, I think there still is uh, a unit, a small unit in the World Bank, which is uh, called something like participatory communication for development. And uh, another speaker you've had here, I think online, I just learned this over lunch, Paolo Mephalopoulos, a uh, good friend of, of mine, former student in fact, although I'm not sure who learned, who was teaching whom in his case. Um, but, um, uh, Paolo, uh, for a while, was, was in that unit. And I have to say, I, I remember vividly Paolo telling me a couple of things. Uh, one was how previously he'd worked with the Food and Agriculture Organization based in Rome. And the FAO, were, of all the UN agencies, was the agency which had taken the issue of participation and uh, a, a democratic, if you like, approach to development projects and the role of media and communication within them, um, they had taken it the most seriously. And Paolo had worked on an FAO-funded project in Southern Africa, embracing several Southern African countries over a period of three and a half years. And he said, I remember him telling me how distressing it was, this was about 10 years back or perhaps more, but how distressing it was to him who believed in this project, who believed in this ethos, who believed in this way of going about things, and where the word was everywhere, participation was everywhere, and the FAO was officially behind it. But in the actual event, the actual real concrete amount of participation turned out to be really quite small. And indeed, it, it sort of went from there to a point where people could not put together a proposal for funding for some uh, development project without the word participation being scattered all the way through it. Uh, if any of you apply for grants, you'll know how granting agencies work from time to time. They change, of course, which is very irritating, so you have to keep up. But um, they have their set mantras that have to be sort of scattered through your text for them to know that you are actually on the same ocean liner as them. And I say ocean liner because very often these agencies are a very long way from the rest of humanity. Um, the, um, so what I'm trying to say is here to, to kind of pull the threads together on this first paradigm 
um, is that um, in its favor, you can say that it does take the pressing and urgent needs of development for the mass of humanity seriously. At that point, however, I think historically it has often, with the exception of this latest trend of communica the Communications for Social Change folks, historically, if you look at the trend of development, it's been one which has, whatever its rhetoric, has tended still to be trapped in a much more vertical than horizontal approach to the pressing issues, the urgent issues of development. Um, and as a further illustration of what I see as, as, as part of the problem, in the organization of which I'm, for the moment, elected vice president, the IAMCR that Thomas mentioned, um, we have actually two sections and this is by way of a little lead into the next point. We have two sections in that organization. One is called community communication, and the other one is called participatory communication. So even within an organization which focuses on all kinds of development and international issues, there is a sort of a division between these two groups. So why would that division be there, and, and, and what's it about? Well. If you actually look at the program and the panels, the people who sign up for community communication tend to be working within more uh, affluent nations and researching within more affluent nations and researching on issues within those nations, tend to be. In participatory communication, it is overwhelmingly people working in nations of the global south or on issues affecting those nations. So there's there's this strange um, organizational reflection or expression of the division between paradigms that I'm here to talk about a bit. So let me now go on to the, if you like, the community communication paradigm and talk about that for a bit. Um, but before I do that, let me just pause for a second. Is there, are there any sort of like basic informational questions or clarification questions that anybody would like to ask um, before I move on to part two. Yes. Maybe just a repetition of the second paradigm, participation communication. Uh, participatory communication is, is the usual, ad, uh, the usual adjective. Yeah. Anybody else? The lights are a little bright, so make sure I can see your hand if it's if it's up. Okay, um, community communication. My um, term of preference uh, for this is social movement media, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, basically the term community communication, there's a, a forest of terms which are around to describe this. Some of them work with the term alternative media, some of them community media, some of them citizens media. Um, I, as I say, tend to go for social movement media. I don't think any one of them has an absolute kind of uh, grip on the situation. I think each one tends to address one facet of what, for clarification's sake, say now I will simply term neutrally nano media, nano media. And what do I mean by nano media? I mean tiny little media, um, whether it's you know at the high tech end, the internet, uh, somebody's blog, or um, a, a community video project, or an alternative radio station, or you know an alternative documentary, a sort of hard hitting documentary or whatever, um, but all the way through to street theater and popular song. And indeed the body, I mean dance and the voice and uh, tattoos and graffiti and murals and public art and you know, a whole variety of forms of, uh, of, of communication strategies, if you like, or of forms of cultural expression. But what they have in common is that they tend to be either underfunded or not funded at all. Uh, they tend to be small scale. 
Um, they tend uh, quite often to be here today, gone tomorrow, and not always. Some examples have gone for over 100 years. But um, quite often they are ephemeral media. Uh, they're not, uh, all of them therefore, very different from what we think of when we say the media, when we immediately tend to focus in on mainstream media, well-funded either by corporations or by taxation uh, or by some religious institution uh, or maybe a trade union body in some countries. Um, those are mainstream media. They have reliable funds and they, have, they know they're going to come out every day or every week or every month, whatever is their pattern, uh, every hour, every minute. Um, the media I'm talking about, nano media, are very often overlooked entirely in the process of talking about media. And I'm going to suggest to you, uh, which is why I use the word nano media, I'm going to suggest to you that um, this is already a mistake to equate size with significance. There are, I mean, in questions I can start giving uh, specific illustrations if you like, but um, in an age when nanotechnologies of all kinds are extremely important in all our lives, whether we're aware of them or not, whether we talk about them or think about them or not, where nanotechnologies are incredibly important, it would be a mistake to rule out of count, to begin with, media which are small and seemingly insignificant. And usually the problem is that people approach them asking the wrong question. They approach this, these kinds of media saying, well, um, they are weak versions of mainstream media which really misses the point, because very often they're not trying to be mainstream media in the first place. Very often they have no ambition to be great big media speaking to the whole of Sweden or the whole of Denmark or the whole of the world. Um, I give you one quick example just to give you a, a toehold on this. It's one I sort of regularly use. Uh, and it comes from a study of uh, Thomas's and my and, and others' friend Clemencia Rodriguez at the University of Oklahoma. Clemencia is born and raised in Colombia. And the first book she wrote had a terrific chapter in it, amongst others, uh, which looked at the experience of a group of uh, migrant worker women in a very, very poor neighborhood in Bogota, the capital of Colombia. And uh, these women managed to get hold of some video equipment. And uh, the experience was extraordinary because by using the video equipment and seeing each other on the screen, right, they had the experience not only of seeing their own faces on the television screen, which until then for them had always been a screen occupied by others, but also their own sort of slang and local version of Spanish from the region of Colombia they came from, their sort of migrant worker untutored Spanish, if you like, um, was something which was dignified and real by being on the screen. And also they knew that they had been able to master the technology sufficiently in order to make this happen. Right? And the point being that they had no intention or desire to speak even to their whole neighborhood, let alone the whole of Bogota or the whole of Colombia. That was not the point. What they were trying to do was develop their ability to use this technology in the service of the needs, various needs, some of them quite pressing, of their urban slum. And um, Clemencia describes very well how you know, the success of this should not therefore be thought of or measured in terms appropriate to the national press or the national television system of Colombia. It should be measured in its own terms and asked what it does locally. The assumption that if something small happens locally, it doesn't matter, is a question which she throws back at her readers and says, why? Why doesn't it matter? Why is this irrelevant? Why is the development of power among these women and in their community somehow something trivial or, or something only for 
people who have nothing better to do to kind of think about and study. So, nanomedia, nanomedia. Like nanotechnologies, it suggests there's a lot going on here which the usual questions we ask of media are inappropriate to and will not bring out a coherent answer to. I personally, as I've indicated, prefer the term so, uh, social movement media because in a way it begins to answer the question of in what context and with what dynamic are media of this kind most effective, most um, uh, empowering. And I would suggest that although far from all nanomedia are social movement media, it is typically the interrelation, the integration between social movements of one kind or another, be they small ones by local housewives trying to put together a crossing which will make life safer for their children, or some major movement as in Iran uh, against the regime uh, about 18 months ago. Um, whether large or small, whether visible or invisible to a national public or an international public, these, are, these social movements are the, the moments and the, the, the forms of social interaction in which media, nanomedia of this kind, are typically at their most effective. Because, precisely because they draw their strength from and give their strength to these social movements. Um, and uh, you know, I could run on with other empirical examples and would be happy to do so if, if, if anybody wants me to. So you'll notice though in passing perhaps that my definition of media in this context is much, much more anthropological than technological. In other words, for me, the body itself is a communication medium, as in dance, as in tattooing. Um, uh, dress is a communication medium, or, or certainly can be. Um, and so on up, a street theatre, popular song, and the rest of it. It's an anthropological definition of media. And I think very often we suffer because we, we somehow split off uh, what I might loosely call high-tech media from media and communication. And, and we have this sort of wall in our brains uh, sort of separating the two. Which maybe when it comes to mainstream media is okay, but when it comes to nano media, I think it's really not very helpful. Um, and these uh, media are not necessarily seen in uh, political terms, but very often they are in, in, in sort of inside the, the thinking about them is one of challenge to the status quo, challenge to the established order. And I don't necessarily mean economic order or, or governmental order or global kind of uh, world order, uh, but it can also be a gender order. Or it can also be a, heter a heterosexist order. In one way or another, these uh, media typically set out uh, to challenge something, not necessarily in dramatic and flaming terms, uh, although sometimes they do that too, but they set out to challenge some feature of the order in which we live and to uh, make some dents in it and begin to perhaps um, alter it a little. So putting this um, paradigm of small-scale media, uh, sort of trying to summarize it for a moment, and as you may detect, this is the paradigm that I'm the most sort of at home with where I've done most of my work, um, the, um, the distinctive feature, I think, of this approach is that it assumes always, the social movement media approach, it assumes always that there is, in fact, some issue of social justice, some issue of social change which has to be tackled. And this, in a way, is what differentiates it from the mainstream of the old style of communication for development research, which in a sense assumes almost that the social and political and economic order is benign, but there are some problems in it. 
There are some problems that some people don't have potable drinking water. There are problems that some people don't have literacy. There are problems that some people don't have access to health care. And it's all real, it's all true, and it's all urgent. But we don't, I think, live in a world where the origins of these problems are kind of irrelevant, and all we have to do is find quick ways to fix them and then we can kind of settle back and feel good about ourselves. And this is where the social movement media approach never leaves behind uh, issues of politics with a small p, right? It never leaves those behind. Whereas tendentially, historically, one whole dimension of particularly the American communication for development approach uh, was in fact set within a Cold War framework uh, and indeed where the, the, the whole word development as Arturo Escobar has, has, has shown uh, the whole word development basically came to have a meaning which implied real development would mean following Western models implicitly. And I'm not saying everything in Western models is, is wrong and hideous and comes from Satan either. But it's just the assumption the assumption that uh, the, 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 the Western or Western ways of doing things are automatically what the rest of the world needs. Um, I'm not even sure the West needs them myself, but that's another matter. Um, so let me pause there again um, before moving on to the, the third paradigm. Um, any questions for clarification? I'll take more arg argument and debate and violent disagreement and so on, uh, we can get to that at the end. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, are there any clarification questions of definition or whatever that anybody would like to throw my way? Yes? Uh, in this last paradigm, what would be the role of, uh, of a researcher or, a, or a communication person? Uh, by communication person, you mean like a communication professional, somebody with certain sort of media talents and experience and so on. Um, the, the role that I would see would be to uh, put their, either their creative talents and experience or their research skills and experience um, really at the service of um, the social movement in question. Which, and but when I say at the service of, I don't mean automatically that you that the researcher's job is then to write research which shows how wonderful everything is in this social movement. I don't know of any social movement which is all wonderful, right? Even the ones I like, right? So, um, but at the service of really means using their their intelligence to be at the service of, which can mean a a reflective critique. Not simply, I mean, enough of hymn singing, right? So does that answer your question sufficiently? Okay. Yes? No. Okay. I sometimes tell students in my classes, be careful at this, moments like this. If you raise your finger, it's like being at an auction. You know, you may find you've walked away with a $5,000 picture that you didn't actually want. So... Um, um, Okay, the third paradigm, uh, knowledge sharing. And somebody whose name is particularly associated with an emphasis in this direction at the moment, but he's far from the only one, is the uh, Belgian uh, communication media researcher Armand Matelard, um, uh, for whom this has become, uh, as he reaches the end of his career, he's now uh, in his mid-70s, um, has become the sort of the, the dominant theme of, of his work. And obviously, and in, in a context like Medea and so on, in a sense, this may uh, be the most familiar zone to, to some of you here, I don't know. But it's fundamentally axed on the notion of uh, intellectual property and the extent to which uh, various forms of intellectual property legal regime globally and nationally around the world uh, very often spearheaded by the U.S. government, um, are in the process of setting up access to knowledge 
um, which uh, is knowledge which can only be accessed by those who can pay. And where basically a sort of global uh, economic inequalities will come to determine uh, largely who can get access uh, to knowledge rather than knowledge being seen as something which is part of humanity's construction and culture and which all humans should have as reasonable and easy access to as possible. And the, the corollary of that, of course, is that if you look at the unequal distribution, even to this day, of communication technologies around the world, although it has changed unimaginably in the last 10 or 15 years, but the fact remains that uh, if you don't have electricity, um, a lot of that is by definition unavailable to you. So, um, the question of knowledge sharing and the extent to which not merely, I mean, for a lot of undergraduates, what this comes down to is, you know, can I download music for free? And that's fine, and, and I believe in music being widely available, and I think it's terrific. But of course, it, it affects so much more. It affects seeds, it affects medicines, it affects uh, even the human genome. It, it affects virtually every feature of our lives. And so, who can get access to this information? Who can um, uh, be in a position to use the access, even when it's there, because of issues of literacy, computer skills, and, and the rest of it? Um, this is clearly uh, a, a pivotal issue uh, for the planet at this point in time. And so, the question of knowledge sharing becomes extremely important. Um, and it embraces, clearly, as I said, education, science, engineering, medicine, and, and many more. Um, the issue here for me is, um, I have no difficulty at all with the basic premise. The issue for me, again, is really one of sort of emphasis and focus. That what is often silent in this kind of, of discourse is... Um, attention to what I would call um, issues of emotion, of uh, humor, of imagination, of feelings, of play. It's implicitly very sort of rational. It's sort of very fact-based. It's very kind of cognitive in, in a narrow sense of cognitive. It's not something which engages with what the late uh, English uh, social and labor historian Edward P. Thompson um, once described as, uh, well, he, he put it this way, he said, uh, fully one half of culture is composed of feelings and, um, and imagination. Fully one half of culture, right? And another uh, distinguished English um, uh, writer, um, Raymond Williams, uh, spoke of feelings as having the same structure in the sense of having the same irreducible, concrete impact on our life, on our lives, as, um, as, as the economy. Uh, the term he used was the structure of feelings, and people have sort of run about with that phrase a bit and tried to sort of puzzle what he really meant. But really what he was doing was, he was talking to old-style Marxist leftists who had this sort of obsession with economic structures. And he was basically saying, feelings are as structurally influential, emotions are as structurally influential in our lives as economic forces. And unless we kind of recognize this full reality, we are missing out on, on half the lives we actually live and, and what makes them happen. So, as I say, the, the, the problem with words like knowledge and information, they don't have to have this constricted sense which blots out the imaginative, the emotional, the emotive, and the rest of it, uh, humor and play and so, and so on. They don't have to blot that out. And I mean, we all know that in electronic terms, you know, the pulses are all, it's all information, whatever it is, it's, it's all information in that sense. But there's a problem I... I'm suggesting to you with those two terms that there's almost a, a masculinist kind of drift to them, which kind of pushes you in the direction of a sort of 
Habermas type rational, cognitive, uh, discursive um, vision of, 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 of how we live and, and who we are. And I think it's, um, it's in, in as much as that happens, I think it's quite uh, potentially destructive. And I mean, the other couple of things I just want to note about this sort of model is, and it's particularly a model which people who work a lot thinking about digital networks and, and so on are, are concerned with. Um, and that is, uh, there's this notion that somehow uh, digital networks are automatically horizontal and therefore encourage horizontal, cultural, communicative activity. And certainly, that kind of activity is enabled by digital networks. There's no question about it. But the fact that a lot of it is horizontal does not mean to say that power has vanished from the scenario. And all those people who work for the National Security Agency in Fort Meade, um, uh, Maryland, in the United States, and all those people who work for the Pentagon, they're all using digital networks, right? And there's lots of horizontality in the way in which, no doubt, they share information and so on. But the notion that somehow power has vanished out of this process, um, you don't have to think about for very long to recognize that, that there's a, a, a major misperception there. And it's amazing to me, maybe this is not true here, but certainly in the United States, where I've been teaching all these years, the number of people who somehow think that they own the internet, that the, the, the infrastructure of the internet is somehow theirs, and of course it isn't. I mean, power is inscribed in who owns the infrastructure right now. It doesn't mean to say that you can't use that infrastructure in horizontal ways, right? But the actual infrastructure itself is not owned by the general public in any country. And I think people are all too ready somehow to sort of glide over that and be fascinated by the latest twist in Facebook. And the latest twist in Facebook is usually very interesting, but it's only part of the story. It's only part of the story. And the issue of power, verticality, is not out of the picture in any way, shape, or form. So, um, summing up on this third paradigm, um, for all its problems as I see them, um, its strength to me is precisely that it focuses in on um, how in a digital era uh, knowledge can be shared or it can be protected and guarded and have very expensive fences put around it. And that seems to me to be an absolutely critical issue, and one which quite often the people in these two prior, working in these two prior paradigms, don't really pay much attention to. It's as though there was a kind of, nobody ordered it to happen, but there's a kind of an instinctive division of labor between people working in one or other of these paradigms. So my purpose today, which I'm drawing now, thankfully to a close, um, my, my purpose today is to suggest to you that if we are to develop interesting strategies for social change, and of course if you don't want to do that then it doesn't matter, uh, but um, if you want to develop, if we want to develop interesting strategies for social change, addressing communication and media and digital network issues, then it seems to be absolutely essential to bring together the urgency of extremely practical village issues and urban slum issues in the Global South with the political challenges which of many kinds which are inscribed in social movement media with an acknowledgement of the crucial need for a development of a global policy of knowledge sharing as opposed to knowledge hoarding. Thank you very much. ourselves, but of course maybe facilitated by you, by you, John. So uh, 
I will play the role of the facilitator, but maybe just get into it. I have a series of questions, but uh, let's see what you have of the comments and questions. Let's see if we can get a debate going. Okay, yes, sir. Let's start with this. Yeah. Maybe you could introduce yourself from the middle. Okay. My name is Jonas Bergrom. I work here at Medea doing interaction design, basically, for collaborative media. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you see any, you know, taking off what, from your third paradigm, I guess, mm -hmm. if you see any connections or interesting relations between um, tactical subversion, counterculture type mm -hmm. things, and the digital networks? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in principle, obviously there are plenty. I mean, the, the digital networks you know, um, can open themselves up to these things. Uh, but again, depending on the country you live in and the degree of government control over, over, over internet freedom and so on. Um, but when you say countercultural and tactical, um, let me just uh, check that we're on the, uh, s a sort of similar page here. Uh, for me, countercultural is is a term which particularly sort of goes back to the sort of 60s and 70s, and um, I, I immediately think of kind of uh, sort of hippie movements in the United States and so on and so on. And tactical for me is very much associated with Herd Lovink and uh, the kind of work he does in Amsterdam and Australia and, and so on. So, I, I, when you use those terms, am I hearing the right bells or the wrong bells? <laughs> no, actually, the reason I came up with those particular words was that you started talking about power issues. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems that in any system that has power asymmetry, there mm. will always be some sort of reaction, mm -hmm. some sort of um, expressions of discomfort mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from below. Right. So I just picked a couple of terms that I thought would yeah. capture that. Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's... I mean, the... The logic of sort of domination and, and resistance, uh, hegemony and counter-hegemony is, is sort of well inscribed. But of course, you know, it, it also, it's, it's a complicated thing because it, it's not like a chemical reaction. It, it's not instantaneous. Um, the, the social chemistry of this process can be a lot more underground and long term. I mean, and in a way, if I can use your, your question just to make one other point, which I might have made before. Very important in this whole thing is the notion of time frame. What is the, the, uh, what do we expect to be the time frame of the results of anything we do? Are we looking for an immediate response, an immediate uh, sort of a flash mobilization through Facebook? Or are we looking for, for something which may take, you know, like the, the sort of underground Samizdat movement in the former Soviet Union? Uh, former Soviet bloc, uh, something which may take decades to kind of begin to, to, to have its full effect, may take a generation or more to have its full effect. So um, often I think when people, as it were, look at nanomedia and think, well, really, who cares? Uh, it's because they have a much sh too short a time frame in mind um, for, for anticipating uh, the results of, of, of these projects. Can I? Yeah. I think I know what I want to ask. A logistical question. We, oops, we were supposed to use this one, so yeah, maybe you could just... Uh, I think I know what my question is now, actually. Um, <laughs> well, the, the timing of this is really perfect. Then. I know, I know. <laughs> it's like I knew it. Um, do you with your long view and your overview of the field and so on, do mm. you see any evidence or indication that the quality or quantity or nature of, let's call it uh, tactical, subversive, mm. countercultural mm -hmm. intention, action, movements, mm -hmm. do you see any evidence or indication that the nature of those things have changed due to the emergence of the digital media scape? Mm -hmm. Or is, it just, is that just a cliche? No, I think, the, I think certain opportunities have emerged um, which really didn't exist before. Um, but 
if I were, if you put a gun to my head and said you've got one sentence to answer this, right? Which I hope you won't. Um, partly because I can never do things in just one sentence, but um, <laughs> um, I would say my 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 problem is that all the attention uh, to digital networks is about issues of immediate mobilization, and much less about questions of ongoing debate and dialogue. How do we achieve that online? <clears throat> I mean, we know how difficult it is face to face, right? How do, we, how do we achieve it online? And I think it's crucial that we should in a, in a planet that's shrinking in so many ways. Uh, I think it's crucial that we develop ways of doing this. And clearly things like Skype and all the rest of it can begin to make a, a very low cost difference. Um, but how to, how to engage in onga, a dialogue that builds, right, uh, in online ways, I mean that, for me, would be an absolutely absorbing research project. And I don't know that there's as much attention to that as there is to the flash mobilizations. Do you have any, do you, do you, do, does, do, does yeah, that spark a thought in return? Uh, yes, lots of them, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the immediate one would be that the way I see it, with the digital media scape, it's not so much a matter of building one sustained dialogue, but mm -hmm. rather sustaining thousands of mm -hmm. dialogues. That's more in my mind, you know, the nature of that, mm -hmm. those media compared to what you call the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So it's a structurally different kind of development that mm -hmm. we have to foresee and to engage in, I guess. More fragmented in ways, but also more agile, more... Mm. Uh, Dynamic, I suppose, yeah. more contemporary, perhaps. But, I mean, uh, there's also obviously the question of language, yeah. uh, which is critical. And once you have thousands of these things going on simultaneously, um, how many of them can, even on the most minimal level, engage with each other? Yeah. I believe lies in the continuation of what <laughs> just has been asked, which is whether you have or you could comment on what's going on right now uh, mm -hmm. with WikiLeaks, mm -hmm. in the sense that, I mean, yesterday the Swedish government's website was closed down by the anonymous hackers that mm -hmm. are defending WikiLeaks. You have PayPal, MasterCard, Amazon, all these big companies closing down on WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. There's a <coughs> and then you have a solidarity movement apparently f in favor of WikiLeaks. So suddenly we have this cyber war going on, which seems to be about the power of over particular knowledge, mm -hmm. which WikiLeaks is posting out there uh, in the public domain. <coughs> Do you have any comments regarding, especially your paradigm three, uh, on this mm. unfolding drama, which might also be more of a flash mobilization, but maybe also can lead to this, what you call a dialogue that builds? Mm -hmm. on that well, I mean, uh, 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 a couple of things um, in maybe no, no very good order. Um, one is that from the beginning, what has struck me is the difference or, or the, the, the contrast in a way between this episode and the 1969 episode of the Pentagon Papers, which uh, in case anybody here is not familiar with that, it was when uh, a former CIA uh, analyst, Daniel Ellsberg, um, found the hypocrisy of the American government's behind-the-scenes analyses and, and shenanigans concerning the war in, in Southeast Asia uh, so abominable that he uh, leaked to the New York Times uh, a whole series of internal policy documents. Um, and the Nixon administration did its best to uh, shut the New York Times down from, from publishing them, but in the end was unable to. Um, and I think that experience was very much in the minds of, and I'm now talking, of course, about mainstream media, but the, um, very much in the minds of the New York Times, The Guardian, and what was the third newspaper, which... Uh, there, were, there were three newspapers, uh, I, uh, Le Monde, I think. Um, 
there were three major national newspapers that actually um, uh, published some of the stuff uh, themselves, and they did it simultaneously. So it, it was going to be much more difficult for any one newspaper to be put under colossal pressure from its own government. Um, and that gives you some sense of how people at the top of some of those newspapers understand their relationship to power, that they were sufficiently nervous to do this. So that's one dimension. Second dimension of the comparison uh, is that the Pentagon Papers were really uh, quite dry analytical policy documents written for the most part in policy speak. Whereas what WikiLeaks does is show uh, these very important people uh, with no clothes on. Right, They're absolutely no more intelligent than the rest of us, just as, if not, uh, kind of more kind of humdrum and, and sort of obsessed with trivia than, than most of us, right? I mean, it, it, it's this huge light on the, on the ridiculous failings and pretensions of those who purport to govern us uh, in our own interest, um, which I think in some ways is the most dangerous thing here. There's a further dimension of danger, uh, which has been talked about quite a lot, which of course is the, um, the notion of, of endangering uh, people who have uh, collaborated with the United States in various countries. And that um, to do so you know, without their foreknowledge uh, meant that they would not, and their families would not, uh, be able to to put themselves out of harm's way or even try to put themselves out of harm's way in terms of retributions. And that is obviously more complicated because whether or not you think of these individuals as being right to collaborate or, with the United States or not in any given instance, um, you know, when you also know that there are people out there who have no problem in taking out their families as well, I mean, there was a lot of people potentially involved at, 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 the, at this point. Um, and so that dimension is another one. Um, and I've got a couple more to come. One, one thing, however, which I think needs bearing in mind is that um, uh, this guy, Assange, uh, did, a, did attempt uh, to inv invite, I mean, he did invite the US State Department to look at what he got and to purge it, and actually did some purges of his own. But the State Department refused to collaborate. Now, I don't know, I don't work for the State Department, never have, never will, but um, I imagine that their logic was, if they agree to collaborate with this guy, then you know, the precedent is set, and maybe they're gonna have to start opening up all kinds of things to all kinds of people, and they won't know who they are, and they won't have any control of the situation. So the only thing to do is to find your little Dutch boy to put his fist in the dike before it, it becomes uh, impossible to, 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 to handle. Um, in terms of uh, the mobilization in his favor, I'm encouraged to see that uh, trying to change the terms of debate in terms of his alleged sexual uh, uh, behavior, right, um, doesn't seem to be working for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, it's so, it's been such a, a ready crutch uh, for governments to rely on, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, just to try and change the terms of debate, debate. So people start thinking, well, the only person I know who's responsible for WikiLeaks is this guy Assange. And uh, apparently he's uh, sort of a, a, a sexual predator or a wife beater or a, or a semi-rapist or rapist or whatever. Um, and I mean, maybe he is, maybe he is. But it's a, a, a splendid way, a, a time-honored way of trying to divert attention, which doesn't seem to be working as far as I can see. Uh, people seem to be wise to that kind of stuff. And so um, the mobilization uh, in support of him, I think, personally, is absolutely critical. And um, I think that uh, briefly shutting down the Swedish government's website may be one thing, but I think in general shutting down websites 
uh, is not something which I kind of believe in on a, on a long-term basis. I, I, I don't think it does anything. Uh, very shortly, it's going to alienate more people because of what they can't access um, than it's going to bring them in. So I, I hope they don't repeat that personally. But um, I, um, I still think that this uh, mobilization is an absolutely critical one, and it, it hangs on you know, the ability of so many governments to drag us into war over the last 10 years, led by the United States, but sadly with active collaborators around the world. Um, and um, an awful lot depends on what happens now. It, it's a very critical moment, indeed. I don't know if that... That's, those are my initial thoughts. Could you just elaborate a little on what you said in the beginning that, about the dangerous part of this, that uh, these people were, were caught without their clothes? Um, well, um, I guess my point is that, that uh, uh, Assange did, I think, do uh, as much as he could by, by offering the Pentagon the right to, uh, to, uh, to clip stuff out. Um, but once they refuse, once they refuse, what are you going to do? Um, and so um, at that point, um, I, I feel as though, you know, since the Pentagon knew he would probably go ahead, um, that the Pentagon bears at least as much responsibility for what would then happen, as does he. My name is Pamela Sevas and I work at uh, Medea. Uh, I'm wondering a little bit about, uh, because we talk about things that move, uh, change, development, and movement. Mm -hmm. And I think about another word in that uh, direction. It's, uh, it's innovation. Mm -hmm. And I would like to hear your thoughts on what is called social innovation. Social innovation. Um, it may be a term with some particular uh, reference which I'm not picking up but I mean could you illustrate uh, for me social innovation is a very generic term so could you illustrate uh, do you have something uh, I think that uh, people here can uh, somebody here from Medea can talk about what is social innovation mm -hmm. I think it may be the term has a particular resonance in in this program uh, which I'm not aware of so I, I'm if somebody can enlighten me I may or may not find something intelligent to say <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there somebody who can just give me a quick sense? Can you give me a quick sense as to what, what, what kind of focus uh, to talk about social innovations? Um, social innovation is sometimes linked to what is called societal entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, it often starts with Muhammad Yunus, this microeconomic uh -huh. uh, thing. It's about what I can see is somewhat way of uh, bringing in... Uh, not only communication researchers or researchers going in and uh, and doing stuff, fixing things, but mm -hmm. instead making new things together with other people. So, for example, at Medea, we are collaborating with uh, underprivileged groups mm -hmm. here in, in Malmo. For example, uh, uh, immigrant uh, mm -hmm. women um, uh, trying to uh, make them a, a research a resource for uh, uh, Malmo. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, one example there of social innovation is how uh, the, these immigrant women uh, um, make food, and maybe we'll uh, make a we'll make a TV show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm 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 sort of catching up now. Thanks very much. Um, well, I think uh, it's great. Actually, one of the things I'd uh, intended to touch on when I talked about uh, knowledge sharing and so on, but I didn't actually get to, uh, was the importance of what I call shared knowledge creation. In other words, the notion that knowledge is not something simply that sort of pools what is existing in the past and which, is, which has experts who have studied it um, and who then deliver this knowledge to other people. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying there's no scope for that. I mean, the, the, that's part of the story. But uh, a crucial part of the story, if we're talking about shared knowledge, is developing strategies for sharing not the creation of knowledge. 
And I mean, the example you've just given me, I mean, I don't know more about it than you've just told me, which is you know, just you know, indicative, but uh, would seem to me to kind of fit that kind of objective very well. And so in that sense, it's an image or a paradigm if it were developed, if knowledge sharing were developed in that direction, it sounds as though maybe that's exactly what's happening, um, which would bring my third paradigm much closer to the, to the first two. It, it would be a, a point of, of overlap. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my Hello. name is Charlotte and I work at uh, um, this um, yeah, culture and society mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, with information as an information officer. Um, and I'm thinking of, um, I don't know if it's, it fits in here, but <laughs> mm. I'm thinking uh, about um, if media and digital media and, and um, the technique and everything should be limited, if there, there are boundaries that are good, that mm -hmm. we should have boundaries uh, in um, in what content we publish. Um, um, I'm just thinking if, when you're saying um, knowledge sharing and uh, um, uh, and social movement, if, if it's if you have that uh, agenda and mm -hmm. if you have an idea of what you want to um, what you want to uh, change or mm -hmm. <laughs> accomplish, mm -hmm. um, is it always necessary that is uh, media has to be completely open, if you know what I'm getting at, because I don't know now with the, uh, the new technique uh, as, such as iPads, mm -hmm. now some, some magazines and, and um, institutions have, have bought um, rights to publish part of the newspapers and, and, and um, I don't know, is it Apple that has limited limited like what they, they closed down as well. Right, right. So uh, are you saying... Um, I'm thinking, is, is, there, is there a good thing t to have an agenda in some cases, <laughs> such as um, Apple has? Ah, um, well, I mean, I, I see uh, Apple's agenda as being primarily corporate, but I mean, it, it's... it's uh, I'm sure a number of you here know the work of uh, Jonathan Zittrain um, and his argument that sort of Apple represents a, a sort of a, a key paradigm of what he calls appliance-sized digital technologies. Uh, ones where you uh, sort of in one way or another sacrifice uh, some of the discomforts of being on a very open system um, for locking yourself into a particular brand, a particular proprietary brand. So, I mean, in terms of Apple's agenda, uh, that's one thing. In terms more generally of, of what you, you raised to start with, um, I think that um, am I ever in favor of, um, as it were, controlling or limiting forms of communication? Um, well, I think I'd have to say yes. I mean, um, I think there are certain forms of uh, communication uh, encouraging a sort of revival of Nazism, for example, um, which I would definitely uh, limit. Um, and there are certain forms of communication to children and to people whose who's, uh, Psychological balance is, is very fragile. Um, uh, so, I mean, yes, there are a variety of, of circumstances in which limiting, which are purely free communication, um, I think uh, is inappropriate. Um, I also think, and this was a point I maybe I didn't get to, but I was maybe going to touch on when talking about social movement media, that I wouldn't want you to think that, I mean, I, I, didn't just, I don't just think that social movements are, always have their shadow side and their flawed dimensions. But I mean, there are some social movements which are genuinely ugly and dangerous. And, uh, you know, Nazism and fascism were social movements. Uh, they weren't simply opposed, imposed from above. And people did, across Europe in the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, they did share strategies and ideas for fascist, making the whole of Europe fascist. 
um, across a variety of countries. So it's, it's, it will be a mistake to think of, of all social movements as pointing in a, an encouraging direction rather than in a repressive or reactionary dimension. Um, so again, um, the sharing of information is not always, uh, even knowledge sharing in this, <laughs> in this example, right, is not always a sort of a, a wonderful, I mean, we don't leave the planet we live on by, by engaging in these processes or, you know, they're, they're, they're as flawed and complicated as everything else. I don't, does that? Thank you. Okay. There's one over here, Thomas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a question uh, concerning uh, the second paradigm uh, and the social movement media. Mm. Aren't they very difficult to, to identify today when I talk, is, is for example, yeah, you mentioned it just, but, but is the Tea Party movement, mm -hmm. is that a, a social movement in, or a new social movement? And also the, um, the sort of uh, brown the communities around brown, for example. For, take, for example, the Benetton for, for a couple of years ago, mm. but there, uh, I think there are some contemporary, like, like something similar. Mm -hmm. well, you say uh, brown? Uh, brand. A oh, brand, oh, sorry, brand, okay. Um, okay, um, so, uh, your first example was the Tea Party movement. For me, yes, I mean, that is, uh, there is some heavy funding which has poured into it, but I don't think uh, the funding created it, if you see what I mean. It may help sustain it and expand it, obviously, um, but I don't, think it, I don't think it initiated it. Um, and it's a movement which, in many ways, is actually quite a good example of a social movement because it has um, quite different components. I mean, people are in this movement not because they all agree with each other on everything, but they actually, it's more like a coalition of interests, uh, which is at once its strength, that it engages so many people ac across so many constituencies, uh, also potentially its weakness in terms of sustaining itself, because the inner cracks in the movement may, of course, widen. Um, in terms of Benetton and, and branding movements and so on, those I see, uh, to be honest, as, as primarily uh, sort of vertical operations which create a following, right? Um, but not ones which kind of uh, emerge from below, uh, except insofar as uh, advertisers and branders around the world, the skilled ones, have their ear to our ground uh, uh, very intensively. And to that extent, in a sense, it's, uh, they listen to what's going on on the ground and then they take it and shape it and, and feed it back. But it's not, um, th that whole process is something which even though it draws on everyday culture and our, our priorities and so on, is not something which the, they create uh, rather, they are drawn upon and fashioned and then handed back to us, sometimes very successfully. That's my, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, it's, it sounds good, but it's <laughs> also it was more of a question that it's very difficult to identify these and draw the boundaries where... What's nanomedia and what's yeah. corporate media? And what's well, nanomedia is simply my convenient term to, and it's a rhetorical term, clearly. It's, it's you know, drawing off nanotechnologies to say, hey, don't walk by without noticing what's going on here, right? But, um, but in terms of boundaries, yes, it is difficult. I mean, and that's one of the reasons, I mean, even if you look at the sociologists and political scientists who study social movements, what you find is over and over and over again, they, what they actually study are social movement organizations. So they study those people who are basically full-time professionals, whether paid or not, 
uh, full-time professionals who are the leaders of these movements and who are send out the memos and send out the flyers and, and plan and strategize and so on and so on. And that's because they're easy to get hold of. You can talk to them, they will talk back. And you can write your report and say, well, we talked to the leaders and this is what they think, right? But there can be, you know, a lot that's bad. There's, there's a fascinating testimony at the time. I'm uh, just blocking on uh, Daniel Guérin, quite famous French anarchist of the middle of the last century. And he was in Germany in the period leading up to 1933 for a few years. And he would go to a lot of rallies and so on. And as you know, the Communist Party, the German Communist Party and the German Social Democratic Party had a way of treating each other as the danger uh, and not Hitler, right? And the leaders of both parties were resolutely opposed to dealing with, with the other party. But the rank and file, he found out as he sort of moved through Germany, this is a matter of tremendous frustration to many people in the rank and file of both parties who saw this as being something which they, they couldn't, because of the hierarchical structure of the body, they couldn't change but they long to change, and sometimes at demonstrations there would be attempts to kind of call for, you know, joint action and, and some form of sort of, you know, rapprochement. Um, so it's, it's by way of saying that, you know, studying the leadership of social movements can sometimes actually give you a quite misleading impression of what the whole social movement is about. Um, and lastly, I had somebody ask me almost the same thing at a talk I gave in Montreal about three or four weeks ago. And he said, I've been trying for six years. He said, I'm uh, coming to the end of my doctoral dissertation. Uh, for six years, I've been trying to find an adequate definition of a social movement. And, you know, what shall I do to be saved, as it were? And... Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, my response to him was... Um, wait 15 years, because I don't think this is such a difficult phenomenon for the regular methods of, of you know, sociology and political science to actually deal with. You know, we're always longing to find where the boundaries are. But sometimes we just have to live with the discomfort of not being able to define exactly where the boundaries are, but knowing that something, you know, very heavy jelly is going on anyway, right? It, it, it's the best answer I can give you at the moment. And I may not be around in 20 years' time to uh, give you the definitive one. <laughs> I had a question myself, just following up on Magnus's, which was about um, this boundary drawing. Because couldn't one say maybe that your, 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 your three approaches to media and the relationship between media and social change uh, can both, can be, you can draw a line across where you can see them all three from a <coughs> defending, you might say, status quo versus a more social change mm -hmm. uh, or change-oriented mm -hmm. approach. Because it was only with the second paradigm, what you call paradigms, that you mentioned policy orientation. Mm -hmm. But within the first one, you could also say that there are strong policy orientations for either uh, remaining within an established social order and mm -hmm. then fixing it, mm -hmm. and then on the other hand, uh, <coughs> inviting or uh, encouraging or whatever you want to call it, particip participation and empowerment mm -hmm. um, for to change or to challenge uh, right. what's there. And likewise also with the third one, mm -hmm. <coughs> where, where you can say it's also about, I mean, I, I think the WikiLeaks case uh, currently unfolding is a very good example around internet governance. Mm -hmm. And then we really need policy around this, which is not there right now, on how <coughs> to secure possibly the open the, the openness of that you were questioning around um, the right to communicate, right. Um, uh, maybe regulate it, of obviously, I mean, mm -hmm. policy. Yeah. Much more established and uh, explicit policy around. around. Mm -hmm. So just uh, maybe drawing a boundary uh, across instead mm -hmm. of, down, yeah. No, I think, that, I think that's, uh, I'd be very happy with that as a, as a, yeah. And that's the kind of, in a sense, that's the kind of mapping uh, that I was, uh, Kind of encouraging to 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 develop here exactly. Just a minor added comments to this uh, talk on social movements mm -hmm. because um, 
you mentioned uh, a lot of the things that said in the sociological literature as well about resistance and joining forces and uh, networking and the temporal character and so on. But maybe another important issue, very banal, I mean, uh, meaning making, building mm -hmm. identity. I mean, if you can't make meaning uh, or build identity, uh, people are not there anymore. They move on. I mm -hmm. mean, movements move and so on and change, identity change. And uh, these nanomedia and so on, of course, feeds into that identity building. So identity, very important mm -hmm. when talking about social movements and uh, bottom-up practice and so forth. I mean, I just wondered why identity hadn't been mentioned at all. Maybe um. it's uh, an old term that we're tired of. I'm not <laughs> sure, but I just think it's very important. Uh, so. No, I think you're right, and you're also uh, intuitively right that, that, I mean, there's a variety of terms that I kind of feel as I've lived through over the years, which, you know, from sort of ideology and discourse and space and um, post-modernity and uh, a variety of things, and uh, I've always found it very tiresome the way sort of, you know, everybody is talking about these things for about five or seven years, and then something sort of shifts and, and then it's something else. And, and so identity was, was one of these for a while. And so uh, there are a number of these terms which I try not to use in, in order to give them their life back, right? Um, but, I mean, having said that, um, the question of identity is, is uh, sort of a, a difficult one in a way. Let, let, me, let me tell you one of my sort of standard issues and, and I'd, I'd like to hear what you, what you reply. Um, a lot of people talked about, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, have talked about new social movements, and what they've actually meant is European social movements, um, and sometimes North American ones, focused on feminism, or the environment, or peace, or gay rights, or lesbian rights. And that's all fine, in some sense they certainly are, or were, new. Um, but, uh, they've talked about them as though it, what differentiated them from the old labor movement was that they were all about collective identity. It was an expression of collective identity, and they weren't, in fact, making any demands upon government or corporations. But in fact, if you look at the women's movement, part of the demands in many places are on uh, um, uh, the owners of firms and on governments, to provide better childcare. Uh, if you look at the anti-nuclear movement, it was to disarm or to move out of nuclear power altogether, right? And so it goes on. I mean, gay, the gay rights movement, the lesbian rights movement has been active in pushing for anti-discrimination, for partner rights and civil partner rights and so on and so on. And they go to governments for this. And so my difficulty with the term identity in the discussions of new social movements has been that it, 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 they were so, it seemed to me they were so determined to say these were new that they had to be new in every single respect. And actually there was a very sort of matter of factness uh, dependence on government action or corporate action uh, in many cases uh, which is involved in these movements, demands and activities. So anyway, that's why I shy away from the word a bit, but I mean, it doesn't mean to say that it has to be, uh, it's not important and, and, and has to be rejected. Now, what's your take? Well, I, I think those uh, field dimensions, I mean, what was new about them is that they politicized fields that had not before been politicized. They mm -hmm. were naturalized in kind of discourse, and then you had, I mean, the so-called new social movements of the 60s, I mean, mm -hmm. because they politicized these things, so, but, yeah. Yeah. I'll let other people. Okay. Any other comments, questions? We have about 10 minutes left. No. No. Less. So maybe it's actually quite appropriate that we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we should um, thank uh, John Dowdo very much for coming. I think we had a good discussion and dialogue. Uh, okay. Thank you.